Hello, this is Professor Paul, and in this lecture I'm going to discuss the idea of race and how race is constructed in society as a category of identity. Let's begin by defining what we mean by someone's identity. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, identity is who or what a person or thing is. So it has to do with being. It is a distinct impression of a single person or thing presented to or perceived by others. So it's about how one appears to others. And it is a set of characteristics or description that distinguishes a person or thing from others. So it's a set of qualities that one has. And the Latin root of identity is the word idem which means the same or the same as before. And so we can see there's some related words here. Uh, identical, identify, and of course all the various um, different derived words that we can get from those. And what I want to say here, what I want to introduce is the concept that identity, one's identity, is a way of knowing. Specifically, identity is a way of knowing yourself and knowing others. So your identity is how you identify yourself to others. I am a blank. For example, I am a man. And what you're doing there is you're equating yourself to some model identity, to some category of being that other people will recognize. They know what a man is, so they know what you are. And identity is also how you identify others or how others identify you. They might look at you and say he or she is a man or woman. And you might look at others and say, he or she is a man or woman. And so again, there's this application of the category of some model identity, some known category of identity, like what it means to be a man or a woman, that is being applied to you as an individual by others. It's how they know who you are, how you know who they are, and how everyone knows who, how you know who yourself is. So what are the ways that we identify ourselves and others in the modern world? Well, here are some of the most important categories of identity. There's one's sex and gender, so you identify as male or female. One's race or ethnicity, are you white, black, Asian, etc., etc. Uh, this sometimes crosses over with one's nationality, uh, where you're from. Or it could be another geopolitical unit. For example, within the United States, one might identify as a Texan versus a New Yorker. That's a category of identity. Some people identify by their religion, Jewish, Christian, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, etc. Some people identify by their lack of religion, atheist, agnostic, etc. Uh, identify by sexuality, straight, gay, bisexual, asexual, etc. Um, and we also identify by economic class. What is one's status? What is one's wealth? So these are all the ways, or at least some of the ways, that we identify ourselves and others in today's world. Now, what do these categories of identity mean? Well, over the last few decades, the last century, there's been really a revolution in the way that we understand identity and the categories of identity. And it comes down to this debate between essentialism and constructionism. Essentialism is the belief, and this is what we consider the more traditional belief system, that the categories of identity are real and fixed. That is, that the qualities that associate with some category of identity, with, for example, race, define some essential truth about the individual, that one is defined by that, and this you can know with certainty the truth about the other person through their identity. That if someone is, for example, black, you know something about who they are what they believe, etc., etc. The more recent development, and the one that I hold to, is the idea of constructionism. That is, the belief that categories of identity are constructed through social relations. They're not pre-existing. That is, no matter what your skin color is, you are not quote-unquote black until you are treated as black within a certain social relationship. So the qualities that are associated with any category of identity, the stereotypes, we might say, that we associate with any identity, may or may not apply to any given individual. And moreover, even if those qualities do apply, the individual is not defined by or limited to those qualities. They are not the truth 
of that individual. So for example, one stereotypical association with people who are African American is that they are good at sports. Well, it might be true that a particular African American is good at sports, but that has nothing to do with his race. It's just a random happenstance of history. It's a contingent fact, and it's not something that's determined by or fixed by his race. So let's think more carefully about what we mean by the social construction of identity. Well, that is to assert that identity is defined in relation to social practices, institutions, values, relationships, etc. So we might ask, what is expected as normal for identity X? What is expected as normal for women, for example? What roles, professions, etc. are readily available to or associated with a person of a certain identity? How do others view or treat people of that identity? What social institutions govern, control, influence, etc. people of that certain identity? So we might, for example, think, what do we assume is normal for a woman? What should a woman want? What jobs should a woman have and what jobs shouldn't a woman have? How do people treat women, both other women and men? How do they treat them? How do they behave towards them? And then what are the various institutions that govern women? What are the, the laws, for example, that govern women? What specific political groups, or organizations influence the lives of women? All these things go into making a woman into a woman. This is what may, it's not that she is pre-born or destined to like a certain thing, to behave a certain way, to go down a certain path, but rather it is the social interactions that define who she is and define any social, social category of identity. A few other ideas that support the notion that identity is socially constructed. One is that the social categories of identity change over time. What counts? What is important to defining who you are, both to yourself and to others? So for example, a few hundred years ago, prior to the rise of the modern nation as we know it, your regional identity was probably much more important than your national identity. That is, your local village or township would have been much more, would have been a much bigger factor in determining who you are, what you did in life, who you interacted with, what you believed, and so forth, rather than whatever nation you were a part of. Furthermore, the qualities that are associated with the categories of identity change over time. That is, what it means to be, for example, a man or a woman changes over time. Another example, a few hundred years ago in Western Europe, Western European society, poetry was considered a very masculine activity, something for men to do. And to be a good poet was to show off one's masculine abilities and intelligence. However, now in modern American society, for example, poetry is often considered feminine, something that's not associated so much with masculinity, not that it's necessarily opposed to it, but a man who writes poetry is not considered especially masculine in our society. So what it means to be a man or woman or whatever changes over time, thus upholding the idea that these are not essential, fixed, determining traits of an individual, but they're things that arise through our interactions with one another in society. So the social construction of identity raises a couple of interesting problems. One is what I'm calling here the paradox of identity. That is, it's a way to assert your individual selfhood. I am a blank. You are saying what you are. This is what I am. But you define your individual self through your identification with the group. I am this individual because I am like other people who share these traits. I am a man, that is who I am, but you know that I'm a man because I'm part of the whole category of men. So that paradox of asserting yourself by identifying with others and also by differentiating yourself from those who are not part of that group. Another important issue that this raises is what I'm calling the trap of identity. That is, we can't get out of it. Your identity is relational and inescapable. Masculinity, for example, only exists in relation to femininity. You 
can't have masculinity without comparing it to something different. Whiteness only exists in relationship to blackness and vice versa. So all identi identity categories exist in relation to some different category. And you cannot escape positioning yourself in relations of similarity or difference to others. Your identity is imposed upon you and thus it is inescapable. Categories, the category of identity is defined by the social group. If you are male, then what it means to be a man is defined by the social group. And other people reflect that identity back to you through their actions, expectations, and so forth. They treat you as a man, and so you know that you are a man. And yet at the same time, your identity is chosen and also inescapable. You embrace the identities that seem most appealing to you, and you can reject certain identities. One can reject, for example, the imposed definitions of masculinity or femininity, although it is difficult to do so. And you make yourself known to others through your actions, through the way you identify and embrace a particular identity. So again, you can't escape positioning yourself as a certain identity in response to the identities that are imposed upon you from outside. So even though identity is not quote unquote real, that is, it's not something that's fixed, that's determined, that's an essential part of who you are from before you were born. It's not a part of your genetic code, for example. It's still something that is affects us in a profound way that is a defining feature of our existence. So now let's talk about race and ethnicity specifically. The concepts of race and ethnicity, and it's important to know that these are recent concepts, the way we use them, they are used to define a group of people that are believed to have a common origin, some root that defines them and links them, unites them as one group. And it's important to realize that when these concepts first became current in our thinking, in modern thought, they were a way to differentiate us from them, the self from the other. The word ethnic originally meant someone who was non-Christian or non-Jewish. That is someone who, from the Judeo-Christian perspective, was a pagan or heathen. So there's this sense, which we can still see in much modern uh, uh, social thinking, that only other people have a race or ethnicity, not us. We can see this, for example, in the United States, the assumption that white is not a race or white is not an ethnicity. It's only people who are non-white who have a race or ethnicity. This, however, is not the case. Whiteness is a race that exists in relationship to blackness. But again, initially these concepts are used as a way to differentiate others and particularly the marginalized or disempowered others. How is race defined? Well, in the modern world, race is ostensibly based in biological facts. And we can go back, for example, to medieval and Renaissance Spain, where the concept of the purity of blood arose as a way to differentiate between people who were pure Christians and those whose blood was held to be tainted by some intermixing with Jewish or Islamic peoples. So the idea that one's blood that physical element in your body defined you and differentiated you from another person is one of the roots of modern racial thinking. And this gradually evolved into the idea that skin color and other secondary physical traits, for example, facial features, hair, etc., that these defined a race, that they identified a group of people that could be classified as a particular race. And of course, this gave rise to many pseudoscientific theories like phrenology or the study of one's head shape as a belief that head shapes signal differences in intelligence and race, etc. And in the 20th century, genetics was enlisted to help define race. And this gave rise to such horrible things like the eugenics movement, which attempted to purify uh, race in the United States and other countries and um, 
by eliminating unwanted people of quote unquote lower races. And this was much admired by people like Adolf Hitler. But race often incorporates other qualities, and this is what makes it contradictory. Uh, race can sometimes be mixed up with national or geographic origins. For example, people who are from Asia, is this a race or a nationality? It's considered both sometimes. Religion can sometimes be used as a or considered a racial quality. For example, people of Jewish and Islamic faith are sometimes held to be of a different race. Sometimes people who are Jewish or Islamic might define themselves as a different race. And of course, culture is also a part of racial definition. In the United States, um, for example, the idea of the African-American race is intimately bound up with African-American culture, music, fashion, etc., etc. So race is not something that can be purely biologically grounded, but it incorporates all these other factors as well. We could go on discussing the problems with race as a conceptual category and as an ethical and moral category for days, but here are just a few important problems. As I've said, the definitions of race are arbitrary and they change over time. So for example, in the United States, people of Irish and Italian descent were not always considered white. There was a period when they were considered non-white and were discriminated against by the quote-unquote white majority. The definitions of racial categories can be contradictory and confused. Again, does race, does religion count? Does nationality count? If someone is Asian, does that indicate where they're from or their race or both? And often what defines a racial category can be changed to suit the needs of whoever's in the majority or whoever's the empowered race. They'll change the definitions of, for example, what it means to be white or black in order to reinforce their own position to suit their own needs and to suit their own self-image. Of course, race as a category is extremely reductive and essentialist. It takes a hugely diverse group of individuals and it equates them all to one single characteristic. It takes one trait and defines that as the most important trait that uh, tells you everything you need to know about a whole group of people, no matter what their individual differences might be. And finally, race is a very unscientific category. That is, as we've discovered in the 20th and 21st century, on the genetic level, race disappears. Yes, one's skin color is encoded in your DNA, but it is not connected to any other aspect of who you are or your genetic makeup. So it is only one unimportant line of code amongst millions and millions of other instructions within your genetic code. So race is not really a thing in, on the level of the human genome. So I'd like you just to take a look at this photo. This is from a photo shoot arranged by the fashion designer Isaac West and taken by the photographer Haytham Lafaj. And the idea behind the photo shoot was to celebrate the diversity of blackness, all the different colors that make up what's considered to be the spectrum of blackness. So we have these six different lovely uh, black women, um, yet we can see they all have very distinct skin tones. They look very different. We have this huge range of appearances. And so this does, of course, celebrate just how diverse blackness is, what we consider to be black, can be very diverse. But of course, it also raises the question then, how is it that we can define all these people as quote unquote black based on something as superficial as skin tone, but also when the differences are so pronounced? What really is it that makes one black? Again, it's not something that's in the body or in the individual, but all of these women are called black because that's how they're viewed by society. They're interpreted as, they're read as black and thus categorized as black. So this brings me to a distinction that I'd like to make between what I'm calling racial thinking and racist thinking. We are all victims of, or in some way engaged in, racial thinking. That is, thinking in terms of race. And we can't help this because it's learned. It's part of the basic knowledge about our society that's passed on as part of our education and socialization process. We learn as children that people are, quote unquote, different races. 
And this sort of thinking is structural. That is, it organizes our behavior and thought. It's a way we need it in some sense in order to understand and organize the reality around us in order to know ourselves and others. Racial thinking is essentialist in a way. That is, it defines the other by one category of identity and it assumes the truth or reality of that category. However, and this is the important thing about racial thinking, it's not explicitly or purposefully oppressive. That is, we perceive differences between each other based on race, but we don't necessarily ascribe value to those differences. We just recognize them as differences without something that makes one person better or worse. And racial thinking is unconscious. It is a part of just the way we view reality. It's not something that we consciously necessarily think about, but we can reject or transform it. We can never perhaps get beyond racial thinking. We can't completely eliminate it, but we can transform the way we understand race by recognizing that identity and race is socially constructed, that these are not things that inhere in the person themselves, but that racial characteristics categories are something that emerge through our relationships. Now, on the other hand, we have racist thinking. Racist thinking, like racial thinking, is learned, and it's structural. If you think in racist terms, that organizes your behavior and thought and the way you interpret reality. And it is essentialist in that it takes one category or one trait and uses it to define uh, everything about a group of people. And the difference is that racist thinking is explicitly and purposefully oppressive and denigrating. That is, it is not just a recognition or perception of differences between people, but those racial differences are viewed as signs of inferiority. And it is rooted in a belief that difference, racial difference, must be rejected or isolated or eliminated. And so at its root, racist thinking uses race to define someone's value. And again, racist thinking is rooted in unconscious but also conscious thought as well in that racist thinking is a more active sort of engagement with the idea of race rather than the sort of racial thinking that we're all subject to. But again, racist thinking can be consciously rejected if one works to recognize it and counter it. So just to review briefly, identity, and that includes race, is a product of social relations, of the way we interact with each other. And identity is a way to understand reality, to know who you are and to know who other people are. Yet identity is not real, that is, it's not pre-existing, but it's something that powerfully affects reality. So to say that race isn't real does not mean that racism isn't real or that race as a social category is not real or important. And some questions, which I do not have answers to, but to think about, can we get past race? Can we get past it as a way of differentiating and discriminating against each other? And should we get past race? Should we eliminate it? And I mean by that, one of the most important developments over the last few decades has been the actions by various minority groups to reclaim their racial identity, to own it and to define themselves in contrast to the way that they have been defined by the majority or the empowered group. And that's been a very important part of the liberation of people who are marginalized or oppressed because of their race. So race can also be used or can be reclaimed, at least to some extent, as a category, as a way to liberate people. So should we just eliminate the idea of race? And so this raises, I would say, perhaps the two most important questions and, and that are really perhaps impossible to answer in any definitive way. How do we recognize difference between people and between groups of people without introducing inequality through those differences? And on the other hand, how do we recognize similarity? For example, the idea of a universal humanity that all people, regardless of race, have without reducing or eliminating or ignoring individuality 
or group identities. Again, how do we recognize similarity without reducing difference? So it's that balance of difference and similarity and how do we understand it and what are the important differences and what are the important similarities between humans, individuals, groups. That's the problem of race and, in a larger sense, the problem of identity itself.